The royal coronation is the most important event in a monarch's life. But things don't always go quite as planned. King Edwig was only 15 years old when crowned the King of England. A lavish banquet followed the ceremony. The guests were several courses down when the shout went out, Where is our fair king? He's disappeared. Abbot Dunstan went to look for him. Opening the door to the king's chamber, he made out the royal crown, bedecked with gold, silver and precious gems, and the king's robe, both strewn on the floor. On top of the bed was Edwig, half naked. He was writhing between a luscious young lady of the court and her shapely mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it to me. Uh, Dunstan coughed. <coughs> But Edwig made no attempt to extricate himself from this carnal sandwich. So Dunstan flung the king's robe over him, plonked the crown on his head and marched him back to the coronation banquet. It's time for you to grow up and behave like a proper king, he admonished. That happened in the year 956, a very long time ago. Since then, our kings and queens have mostly been crowned at Westminster Abbey. The coronation is a sacred ritual officiated by the head of the English Church, the Archbishop of Canterbury. It should be a solemn and dignified event. In the year 1066, a Frenchman called William sailed over and conquered England. He was now King William the Conqueror was determined to stamp his authority on the native English by getting that crown on his head ASAP. The ceremony was to be held at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day. There were to be two groups of supporters attending the coronation, the King's noblemen from France and the subjugated English lords. They agreed that the two groups would swear the oaths of allegiance to the King in their own language. The French lords started proclaiming. The English thought, we may have lost our country, but we can still win the Battle of Hollering. They shouted the oaths at the tops of their guttural English voices. This cacophony of sound alarmed the king's soldiers outside the church. They thought their king was being attacked. So they set fire to the wooden houses next to the abbey. The blaze was spreading. Both the French and English supporters rushed out, leaving their trembling new king to finish being crowned in an empty church. Edward II was 23 years old when his father died in the year 1307. He immediately sent a message to the man he loved the most in the world, Piers Gaveston. I know my father banished you from the court, but I am now the king and request that you return. I will then set off to France to marry the fair Isabella and bring her home. In my absence, I request that you look after the country on my behalf. Oh, and by the way, I am also putting you in charge of organising my coronation. As Edward returned to England with his new bride, he was deafened by the cries of outrage about that pompous fool he'd left in charge. Yet he still wasn't prepared for what happened on Coronation Day. As Piers Gaveston strode through the abbey, dressed in the most sumptuous and regal robes, his hands and clothes glistening with precious jewels, the screams of a young girl rang out. Isabella, the 12-year-old queen, was incandescent with rage. Gaveston's jewels were the ones that her father, the King of France, had delivered as part of her dowry. The ceremony dragged on. The attendees consoled themselves with thoughts of filling their bellies at the coronation feast, the one that Gaveston had organised. But once seated in the banqueting hall, they waited several more hours for their food. And then it turned up either raw or burnt. The guests declared it inedible and left in disgust. The Queen wrote to her father, Oh, dear Papa, everything you warned me about English cooking is sadly true. 
The year was 1626. King Charles was not a happy man. He'd been so looking forward to being crowned together with his queen at Westminster Abbey. But here was Henrietta Maria, his 16-year-old new bride, screaming and stamping her feet. I am a Roman Catholic, she cried. It would be a sin to have my head crowned in a Protestant church. Please reconsider, my dear, the king pleaded, only to hear the sound of her fist smashing through a window pane. So the king had to go it alone, and things only got worse. When he turned up for the first fitting of the ceremonial robes, his tailors had a confession. I'm afraid to tell you, um, uh, we, um, about the king's coronation suit, uh, we have completely run out of red and purple velvet. But we do have plenty of white satin available. So King Charles presented himself for his coronation, all five foot four inches of him, in his shiny white costume. He was later known as the White King, but everyone knew that white was an unlucky colour. On the great day, with the herald of trumpets, Charles strode into the abbey. Then, whoops, he started sliding on the polished floor. Whoa. It was only his friend who stopped him from going ass over tit. Then, as the coronation ring was placed on his finger, the precious stone fell out and rolled on the floor. Coronation over, the king exited the abbey, only to feel the ground rumbling beneath his feet. A violent earthquake had just hit London. 23 years later, on a cold winter's day, crowds gathered to witness the end of King Charles's reign. Just 600 yards from Westminster Abbey, they watched the execution of the unlucky White King and saw snowflakes falling onto his severed head. When King James II was crowned in 1685, people didn't kick up much of a fuss. A bit surprising, as James and his second wife, Mary of Modena, were openly practicing Roman Catholics. Then again, the coronation was still going to take place in the Protestant Westminster Abbey. People didn't know they'd already held a private coronation led by a Catholic bishop. And they probably didn't register how many changes the king had made to the coronation ceremony as he chopped out anything that was a bit too Protestant. A couple of mishaps did occur. James's crown had been made for his brother, the late King Charles II, who had a much bigger head. As the crown was placed on the new king's head, it started to wobble and he had to keep his hand on his head throughout the rest of the ceremony to stop it falling off. Then came the great feast where the nobles devoured baby deer, sheep tongues and roasted udders. During the coronation banquet, there was a long-standing tradition. An appointed king's champion would ride on a white charger into the banqueting hall, dressed in full clanking armour. He would throw down his gauntlet and declare, if anyone denies the sovereign's right to the throne, I challenge them to a duel. Well, no one accepted the challenge. So the king's champion climbed down from his horse to kiss the king's hand and then keeled right over. Burdened with the weight of his armour, he just could not get up again. He clinked and he clanked, he flailed and he wailed until some strong-armed guests managed to lift him back on his horse. On the day, these little mishaps were easily laughed off, but it wasn't long before his people stopped being amused by the king's love of all that was popish. Three years later, they kicked him off his throne and he died in exile in France. The coronation of King George III and Queen Charlotte took place in 1761. It might have been a sacred ceremony, but when it came to the planning of it, God was certainly not in the detail. Two important props, the Sword of State and the Royal Canopy, were forgotten. When the time came for the communion, the king asked Archbishop Secker whether he should be wearing his crown at the point of taking the bread and wine. The Archbishop didn't know, so he asked the Dean of Westminster. The Dean of Westminster didn't know, 
So the king decided to take off his crown anyway. But just as Charlotte, his queen, tried to follow suit, she cried, I can't get it off! It's tangled in my hair! But George reassured her, don't worry, my dear, your coronation is not quite as important as mine. The king was definitely more perturbed to see the largest jewel of his crown fall out and roll down the floor of the abbey away from his throne. <laughs> Later on, during the six hour long ceremony, Queen Charlotte needed to retire to use her private toilet only to shriek with horror to find the Duke of Newcastle sitting on it. When, during the coronation banquet, George complained to the man in charge of this almighty royal cock-up, the Earl of Effingham replied, Yes, I sincerely apologise, but I can assure you that the next coronation will be a perfect production. The King, thankfully, saw the funny side of this. It was now time for the King's champion to arrive. He was accompanied by William Talbot, the Lord High Steward, who had diligently prepared for the great day. Knowing that one should never turn your back on royalty, he spent hours instructing his horse to walk backwards out of the room once the challenge was laid down. He pummeled the skill so firmly into his horse's mind that on the day, nothing Absolutely nothing could stop his charger from walking backwards into the banqueting hall. So the king and queen were proudly presented with the horse's ass. Fifteen years later, in 1776, fortune tellers recalled the moment that the great jewel fell out of the coronation crown. They said it was the omen foreseeing that King George III was to lose America his greatest jewel of all. Now we reach the year 1821. King George IV had spent 18 months preparing the most extravagant coronation ever seen in this country. It was a hot day as the procession plodded along a raised walkway from Westminster Hall to the Abbey. George was puffing and sweating and nearly fainted under the weight of his heavy jewel-laden robes. In the church, he needed assistance to raise his corpulent, brandy-racked body to the throne. But it wasn't just the summer heat that was making him sweat. It was the threat of his wife, Queen Caroline, turning up to the church uninvited. He'd taken precautions. He'd employed bare-knuckle boxers dressed as pages to act as bouncers. But inside the abbey, everyone heard the enraged queen hammering on the doors after they were shut in her face. Later, at the coronation banquet, they awaited the arrival of the king's champion. This time, the job fell to the 20-year-old Henry Dimmock. The trouble was, young Henry was not into horse riding. He didn't even own a horse, but he hired a beautiful horse from Astley's Circus. On the day, Henry and his horse entered the hall, kitted up in armour, but the guests were astonished to see what happened next. The king's champion had thrown down the challenge and no one took it. The guests clapped and cheered in response. The horse took this as his cue and sprung into a well-rehearsed routine of circus tricks. Queen Victoria was not prepared for her five-hour coronation ceremony at Westminster Abbey, and nor was anyone else. At least the 19-year-old Queen was there to help poor old Lord Rolls, as this 88-year-old on his way to the throne, slipped and started rolling backwards down the steps. The most sacred part of the abbey is the chapel containing the shrine of St Edward the Confessor. Victoria was shocked to find that on the day they'd converted the altar into a buffet bar covered with sandwiches and bottles of wine. But at least it gave her somewhere to nurse her burning finger the wrong finger onto which the Archbishop had insisted on squeezing the coronation ring, oblivious to her buckling under with pain. Ouch! 
King Edward VII was 59 years old when his mother, Queen Victoria, ended her 63-year reign. Not only was he now the King of Great Britain, but also the Emperor of India. This brought extra responsibilities and planning problems for the coronation. They'd fixed the date, the 26th of June, 1902. 31 Indian princes were to be invited, all needing accommodation after their long voyage to this country. Most were just happy to be invited and enjoyed the chance to visit London. But the Maharaja of Jaipur was both fiercely loyal to the British crown and a devout Hindu. He insisted on bringing his retinue of 200 attendants to England. All would be adhering to Hindu customs during their visit. He demanded accommodation close to Buckingham Palace and to be provided with a pure white shorthorn cow with its own special accommodation. That was a headache. But eventually they found him a house in Kensington, which had a paddock and a well. He refused to drink water from the pipes, but thankfully he'd brought with him on the ship 5,000 litres of holy water from the Ganges River. His special god also came along, requiring its own room and particular food to be made in a separate kitchen. The servants were astonished to find that the god's food was always eaten by the end of the day. The Maharaja of Kolhapur also arrived. This was in defiance of his personal astrologer, who'd advised him not to travel to England because the coronation would not take place on that day. King Edward was not a healthy man. He smoked 20 cigarettes and 12 cigars a day. He regularly indulged in 12 course dinners, resulting in a 48 inch girth of his chest and stomach. His nickname was Tum Tum. Three weeks before the big day, Edward developed appendicitis. He ignored the symptoms, insisting that he would take part in the coronation if it killed him. But three days before, his doctors told him that he had developed peritonitis and unless he had an operation immediately, it certainly would kill him. So he agreed to the operation and later thanked his surgeon for saving his life. King Edward also had a trusted clairvoyant called Cairo. He had predicted that the king would recover from his appendicitis and would live to be 69 years old. It was Cairo who suggested the auspicious date of 9th of August for the postponed coronation. When that day arrived, not only was the king recovered, but he'd lost weight and was much happier in spirit. A major worry, though, was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Frederick Temple, 81 years old, was obliged to conduct the coronation. But he was so frail, his hands were shaking, he couldn't get up on his feet to kiss the king's cheek. And he managed to put the king's crown on back to front. He was so feeble. And so when it came to crowning Queen Alexandra, they asked the Archbishop of York to step in. But he too suffered from the shakes. As he went to anoint her forehead, his hand slipped and the oil slowly trickled right down the Queen's nose. That apart, all went swimmingly. King Edward reigned until 1910, when he died aged 68 and a half. Cairo's prediction was just six months out. Now, who can predict what will happen at the next coronation? We'll have to just wait and see.